For the first time since 2002, the Oakland Raiders made the postseason. Not only made the postseason, but also finished over 500 for the first time since 2002. And suddenly, everybody's throwing Skittles around because they think they can potentially taste the rainbow this year at the end of the season. We'll see. Las Vegas right now has them at 10-1 to odds to win the Super Bowl. The third highest odds in the league. Actually, I should say lowest. What? I, I'm not a gambler. What is it, Brendan? Third best odds. That's, third that's, best that's odds. What you... There you go. To win the Super Bowl. What do you think? Yeah, the Raiders, you... they're good. I mean, they're, they're real freaking good. And they're so good, Adrian, that the NFL decided to reward them with the fourth hardest schedule in the NFL. So – that kind of sucks for Oakland. I mean, honestly, they were they were one injury away from not only winning their own division, but from you know going on and being a Super Bowl contender. The one thing that's interesting to note is while I have the Raiders this year going eleven and five and the Chiefs going ten and six, so the Raiders winning the division, Jack Del Rio has never won a division as a head coach, which I think is pretty interesting. A lot of people don't realize it, but Raiders roster is certainly good enough to win a division and be a Super Bowl contending team. Now, in uh, Jack Del Rio's defense, didn't he have Peyton Manning to deal with? They were always winning 12 to 13 games a season, yep. those damn Colts. Yep, and he did coach the Jags. Yep. Just, that, that kind of sums it up. He coached the Jags. <laughs> so, all right. Third highest odds in the league. I, I mean, I love this team, but that schedule really is brutal. So they got to play New England and Mexico. And do you want me to talk about the last six games or you want to talk about no, go ahead, Adrian. All right. So, actually, it's the last four games of the season. So, well, actually, the last seven games of the season is ridiculous. But so so they got – after the bye, they got to play New England and Mexico City. And then you, you come home for two games, play Denver and New York, and who knows how it's going to be at home this year. I mean, they're going to Las Vegas in 2020. Do the fans even care? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the last four games, at Kansas City, Dallas at home, at Philly on Monday night, at the Chargers, it's brutal. It's tough. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy schedule. I mean, really, when you look at it, the only games they really kind of got gifted away, you know, out of their own um, division, Jets is a gift. Uh, I think the Redskins to the Raiders is a gift. They'll, they'll beat them. The Ravens, they'll beat them. The Bills. Now with the Dolphins injury, there's a gift there. But, hey, I mean, the Patriots, the Giants, Eagles, Titans, Cowboys, right? They have the Cowboys in the schedule too. I mean, those are all teams who are playoff teams. That's not an easy schedule. And then, again, I talked about this in our Chiefs show. You have six games in the conference when, realistically, the Chiefs are every bit as good enough to win a wild card or win the division. The Chargers and the Broncos, they could contend for that last wild card spot too. So – you're playing in a very tough division. Uh, I think the I think the Chiefs are the Raiders this year. The biggest reason they didn't win the division last year was they got swept by the Chiefs, and I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to get they're going to at least split there. I think they'll move to eleven and five. But the interesting storyline to me, the, the Patriots division just got easier with the Tannehill injury. So the Patriots, I think, are going to slide into that one spot. Now the interesting thing is going to be what about the Titans? If the Titans can beat the Raiders week one, and the Titans have a much easier schedule. It's not unrealistic for the Titans and the Raiders both to be sitting there at 11 and 5. Titans having a better record in their division and the tiebreak with the Raiders. And now the Titans get the two seed, which would mean Oakland now would have to go to New England, which would earlier than the Titans. So that would be a really interesting situation to kind of see how it unfolds. I think it's unfortunate because I think the Raiders roster is better than the Titans, but the schedule is going to heavily favor the Titans. So that's going to be interesting to see who's going to get that two or three seed. Yeah, that's exactly right. The Raiders have the better roster, but the Titans have the easier schedule. And, I mean, going 11-5 and five on this schedule, I just said it last show, going 11-5 and five is like going 12-4, and 13-3. That's why I have 10-6. Because 10-6 and six is like 11-5 and five on this schedule. 12-4. and four Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's brutal. And so that 10-6 and six mark is going to make them a four seed in my bracket. Because I got the Titans winning that opening game, so they're going to hold that tiebreaker, go ten and six. Because I got the Steelers at twelve and four, I got them as the two seed. I, you know, 
So and then New England number one. So if the Titans are ahead of the Raiders, yeah, they they uh, the Raiders would have to play New England earlier in that divisional round. Yeah, no, yeah, you're hundred percent right, Adrian. I think all four of those teams are right there. I think the Patriots are the furthest from the pack, but two through four, you talk about the Steelers, they're all real there. So the Raiders, it's not unrealistic for see them go ten and six, like you said, Adrian, get the four seed. But honestly, all four of those teams can beat each other. So I'm yep. not as worried about it, but of course, if you have the opportunity in the NFL to get a buy in the playoffs, you want that. If you have the opportunity to play at home, you definitely want that. Yeah, you're right about the Raiders roster being better than Titans. Titans have an easier schedule. I believe Pittsburgh and, and Oakland is on the same playing field, but Pittsburgh has an easier schedule there too. Yeah. So that's why I got two seed for them. All right, uh, moving on. All right, we'll, we'll talk about Derek Carr first before we get into the home field advantage, if, if they even have one. So I know you love Derek Carr. Where would you rank him right now? How, how good is he? Personally, I'd have Derek Carr four. Um, I think – and this is what people need to realize here. We are living in a really special age right now. We have three quarterbacks in Breeze, Rodgers, and Brady still playing right now that are first bout Hall of Famers. So – you know, with Carr being four, that essentially is me saying Carr is on track to be a Hall of Famer. So Carr is freakishly, freakishly talented. I have him as four. And then at five, you know, you, you can look at guys like Luck or, or, or Ryan. They're in that same group. You know, Luck obviously has never had the protection that those other guys have had. But, I mean, Andrew Luck is every bit as talented. But for me, Carr is my four. He's a big-time winning quarterback, especially in the fourth quarter region, which I know is something you love to t- chat about here. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Now, I have Derek Carr at number seven, but he's certainly on the way up. And, like, number four, I, I, I don't hate that. I'm not going to disagree with that because, uh, I mean, the talent level is obviously there. I mean, age is maybe the reason why I don't have him higher. You know, that's probably why. But Who do you have higher than him? What's that? Who do you have higher than him? Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that right now. So I got Brady at one, Rodgers yep. at two, yep. three, three. Yep. Um, now I put Ryan at four because of the year he had. So, cause I got luck and Wilson ahead of Carr right now, but like I can see Carr vaulting those guys. Yeah. I mean, I would say the year that Carr was having was every bit as, as good as Ryan and they were really close. I would, I would push back on, on, on Russell, but I also understand Russell has won a Super Bowl, So certainly that gives him a little nudge. And I think luck is every bit right there too. Yeah. And then I got big Ben at eight. And then it's Mariota and Winston. And then Cam at 11. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the way I got it. So uh, both of us obviously agree that he would be the best out of that trio of Winston and Mariota too. Oh, for sure. Yeah. All right, so his fourth quarter numbers last year, just absolutely ridiculous. 109.3 passer rating, 10 touchdowns, one interception. I mean, that, that's insane. And then in overtime, it was 130.7, that quarterback rating, uh, 11 completions on 15 attempts. So he gets better as the game goes on. He, he loves the fourth quarter. He loves it with the game on the line. Yeah, he does. I mean, it's winning time for them. I mean, the Raiders are a great offensive line, which certainly makes everything better. Honestly, if, if it was possible for the offensive line to only be four players and not five and not include a right tackle, the Raiders would be the best offensive line in the NFL, but because they have a, a situation right tackle, we'll talk about that later. That yep. certainly makes you know the the pass rush in the fourth quarter much easier. Got a lot of weapons out there, but I mean, damn, his decision making, his quick release, he's got it all, man. He's really special. Yeah, he really is, and uh, I I want to get I'm I'm trying to get the stats on him his first three years. Hold on, I got to go back one more because th- this the great thing about him is I mean. A lot of these quarterbacks, the second year, they don't reach 30 touchdowns. Well, he right. did. He did. So he, here's his uh, touchdown interception ratio his first three years in the league. So 21 and 12 is rookie season. That, that's pretty good for a rookie. Then he makes the jump to 32 and 13. Last year didn't throw as many touchdowns, but the interceptions went down to six. So 28 and six. And, uh, I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. Quarterback rating went up to 96.7 last year. Yeah, and that and that was good enough to finish with the Raiders the top five in turnover margin. Uh, the teams that were ahead of them were going to be teams that were in the Super Bowl, you know, like the Falcons and the Patriots. So turnover margin there for, for what Carr does is very, very good. You know, it's awful to see about his injury, but 
have had a year to kind of grow together. They're a really good team, no doubt. They're Super Bowl contender. Yeah. So now we get to running back. Marshawn Lynch is back in the NFL. Quite frankly, I can't really give you an evaluation on him because I have no idea what to expect. Beast mode. Beast mode. Is he going to keep being beast mode? Is he still beast mode? Oh, I'm so excited about this. First off, I've always been a big Marshawn Lynch fan, so I'll say that. But I don't think it's a stretch to say the last two seasons that we really saw Marshawn Lynch, he was still playing at a top five caliber. Okay. Now, took a year off. You can say, yeah, he got older. Okay, that's fair. I would argue he took a year off for his physical running, for his body to heal, and now he's going to a situation. He's going to play with the best offensive line he's ever had in his career. He's going to play with the best offense he's ever had in his career. And he's playing somewhere where he's extremely passionate about. I mean, if you saw that, that press release or when he first came out and someone asked him, so why the Raiders? And he's like, I'm really, really from Oakland, though. And that was just so cool to kind of see him, you know, say that and show a little passion there. I'm really excited about Marshawn Lynch here. I mean, there's a large reason when you look at the Westgate odds in February. This is a really cool stat here. In February, when the Westgate odds opened up, so pretty much just at the Super Bowl, they opened up as a 20 to 1 favorite to win the Super Bowl. The Raiders did. In June, that's after free agency, after the draft, after obviously the Marshawn Lynch trade, they're now at 10 to 1. So obviously Vegas has recognized the Raiders have done a great job. Marshawn Lynch is a huge piece of that. Yeah, we'll see. He's 29 now. Now, his last year in Seattle, now granted, that offensive line is terrible. But awesome. Yeah, 3.8 yards per carry, which was by far the lowest in, in his career. So you would think, you know, that that's just kind of the outlier and, and maybe he gets back to what he was. He is now 30, is he? 30? Probably pretty close to it. Yeah, but he did take the year off. So I, I agree with you that I would take more of the his body was rejuvenated stance than, you know, because maybe, maybe, all right, it, even if he's 30, okay, fine. But I think for this season, he'll be fine. Maybe not next yeah, season, it's, it's, this year. His physical run style, too, I mean, it makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to wide out. I mean, I love Amari Cooper. He's unbelievable. There's, a, there's some, some special situations they have there. All they did was just get more weapons for Derek Carr. I mean, Cordell Patterson, he's never been a guy who's going to be a true number one threat. But he's really good at running straight and running really fast. So that's really helpful, um, especially when you have two really big physical targets with Cooper and Crabtree. Seth Roberts is another guy, very similar skill set, really dangerous out of the slot. Then they bring in Jared Cook, which I think was a very underrated tight end. So that was a nice signing there for Oakland. A lot of weapons all around. Uh, I think Crabtree, and we'll talk about him a little more, and, and Cooper a little more. How does that kind of pan out in fantasy situations? But it's hard to argue there's a lot of NFL teams who have a better one-two tandem at receiver there. Yeah, I mean, the, the only really blemish on Cooper's stat line is he only had five touchdowns, so that was it. But, I mean, he, he does everything for them. He uh, runs everything. Uh, and then you look at Crabtree. Crabtree is like a reliable red zone target, I think, uh, mm-hmm. as long as he's not dropping the ball. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly right. I mean, again, he's a very physical guy. I mean, his biggest thing is, is the fade route. That's where he's really damn good. Yep. Cooper's a really good route runner, too. I mean, he's not a, he's not a, a, a slouch either at the fade, but Crabtree is a big, big, bigger physical jump ball, go up and get it possession type receiver. Yeah, yeah. And Cooper's just versatile, can run everything on the route tree. So, and, yeah, he, he's just got to get those touchdowns up. That's all. Yep, for sure. But, all right, let's see. Where do I have him? I had him pretty high, Mari. Had him at number nine. There you go. But I got Mike Evans ahead of him. Yeah, big time. I, I think Mike Evans ahead of him, too. Yeah, okay. Uh, moving on. Offensive line. It's a pretty good unit. Pretty damn good unit. I mean, offensive line, they're, they're a top three unit. I mean, again, right tackle is going to be the situation to kind of keep an eye on. That's where they have the most instability, I guess you can say. Um, they, they bring in was it Newhouse, I believe, from the, from the Giants, and he had a very minimal year. Uh, you know, I think he only had six games, you know, for the, for the Giants playing right tackle. So right tackle is definitely going to be a camp position. It's definitely going to be something to, um, to check in on. But 
The great thing, the rest of the offensive line is nasty. Kletcho Osemite is probably the second best guard in the NFL behind Marshall Yonda. Yep. But KO hasn't allowed a pressure, not a sack, a pressure since week five of 2015. So he's unbelievable there. Still have Donald Penn there at left tackle. He's currently in a holdout situation for a contract. That'll get done, but he's still playing at a high level. One of the best centers in the NFL. I was talking with my buddy here who is a big Raiders fan. I'd said he's probably second best center in the NFL. And then Gabe Jackson is a tough SOB at right guard. So when I look at their guard situations, if any of the viewers remember seeing replacements, the two guards who just are the, the bouncers, that's exactly what I imagine the situation is like in the locker room for, for the Raiders. Their offensive line is awesome. <laughs> I got Rodney Hudson at number three. I got Frederick and Mac and then Hudson. Okay, I have him ahead of Frederick, but yeah, again, he's he's very, very good. I mean, he's one of the best pass protection centers in the NFL, which is something that you don't really see a lot. Typically, when you watch Raider games, you see a lot of times that when the guards set in pass protections, they set deep and outside opposed to deep and in, which is what most guards are taught to help the center. Because, you know, you think about it for center, you got to snap the ball, get your head up, and then block, and usually you only have one hand free. But, I mean, Hudson's able to do it all on his own. So he's unbelievable as a pass protector. And, again, that's a large reason why Derek Carr is able to be so successful. But, again, going back to the numbers, I was, you, know, you know what I mean? 8, 8, 7.9, and then there's a gap from the rest of the centers. So it's like, you know, it, it's, it's 1A, 1B, 1C almost. Yeah, that's fair. There you go. All right, moving on. Defensive line. Oh, my God, Khalil Mack. Uh, yeah. Mac is nasty. Uh, I mean, he's he him and Von Miller absolutely have the a talent, not just to win Defensive Player of the Year, but to be MVP level caliber players. I mean, yeah. they are they are that unbelievable. And it's now, not just sacks; he sets the edge too in the run game. Great point, Adrian. Great point about how how good Mac is in a run game. You know, people ask me what's the big difference between Mac and Miller. Max more physical. You know, he is more of a, a guy I would trust more as a down lineman. And sure enough, that's why the Raiders recently, in the last couple of years, made a move to the 4-3, and now uh, Mac is playing a true DN situation. Now, here's the problem. Once you get past Mac, you are in a free fall for production as far as sacks. Um, you know, Irvin is another guy who's shown the ability to do it but they need more help. The Raiders actually finished dead last in the NFL in terms of sacks, and that's a big problem, especially if you're saying, hey, we have the best edge player in the NFL. That's awesome, but why are you dead last in the NFL? That's a big, big issue. So Mario Edwards, he's a guy who's really, really got to step it up. I mean, yeah. when, he, when he played his 2015 season, he had over 40 tackles, two sacks, got hurt with a neck injury. Last season got hurt with a hip injury. He's the opposite D end in a 4-3. He has no excuse to be able to be productive because you know this line is going to slide to Mac every single time. And in situations where Edwards has Bruce Irving behind him, you know Edwards is going to get single situations. So Mario Edwards has got to be production. Uh, defensive line, they did take a little bit of a dip there. They lost Stacey McGee to the Redskins, who was their interior guy. And the bad news is they weren't a very good interior defense before. And they just lost a guy who had two and a half sacks, which was third on the team there. So the Raiders do have problems right in the middle of their defense, and it's a, that's a big, big problem. But when you have Cleo Mack, you can kind of make the rest of the stuff work. The two funnest guys to watch on tape, J.J. Watt and Cleo Mack. And it's because of how many different positions they play, where they line up on the field. I mean – I just love the the one the one play I saw. Uh, I think it was two years ago where where Khalil Mack just li lined up as a nose tackle and just pushes the center back right to the quarterback. I mean, he's he's lined up as a nose tackle and he's doing this. So he's all over the place. Wasn't what, what was the what did he win? Was it was it rookie of the year or, or uh, all first team rookie or was it all first all pro where he was linebacker and the end? He was all pro at two positions. Yeah, so there he's. That's just like that just says everything right there. Yeah. Just oh my god. Uh, linebackers. What do we want to talk about? Linebackers. Bruce Irvin's pretty good. I like him. Yeah, and then there's problems. Yeah. I mean, linebacker situation is not good for Oakland. Their middle linebacker is going to be a big issue here. 
He's a second. He's a second year guy, and he only had 50 tackles in his first year. So it's not like he's exactly a, um, you know, winning the world or rocking the world right now. So there's a big problem there at that middle linebacker position. They brought in Jenkins from Miami, who was a nice coverage speed guy, pretty underrated guy because two years ago he had 70 tackles, three years ago he had over 110. So. He's not exactly an old fart by any means. I mean, he's still a sub-30, I believe, outside linebacker. So getting a guy there at speedy can match up with a lot of tight ends. You know, So look at Kelsey in your division. Look at Hunter Henry in your division. So that's a nice situation there. But he has a little bit of an injury bug history. So I think that was a really undervalued signing for the Raiders. Could it could be it turn out to be a really, really great signing if he's able to come back to what he was two to three years ago. Yeah, I believe Ben Heaney was their line, middle linebacker last year. Just just wasn't cutting it. Uh, so now now we move on to the secondary. Now, David Amerson wasn't as good as he was two years ago, but they still got Sean Smith. He's pretty good. And then the the safeties, Reggie Nelson, and now you're gonna have Carl Joseph in the second year. So the safeties, I think, are are pretty good. We'll see if Amerson can bounce back. Amerson, Amerson does, but I'm also going to push back on you. Sean Smith did not have a very good year last year uh, for, for the Raiders. That's, that's a player they need to kind of see grow, and I think that was a large reason when they had Gary and Conley on the board. They said, yeah, let's go ahead and draft him. Now, obviously, Gary and Conley is in a similar situation as Joe Mixon, and I know both Adrian and I feel the same way. We really don't want to get into the rabbit hole of discussing his off-the-field stuff, but talent-wise, Conley was absolutely the second best corner in this draft. So for the Raiders to get him at the late first round was a complete steal as far as talent is concerned. So when I'm looking at him, his physicality reminds me a lot of Keith Talib or a young Sean Smith. So he's a really nice kind of transition guy. I like him a ton. I hope he can really come in and play. He's a good zone coverage corner. He's a pretty good physical bump and run guy too. So I like that a lot. Amerson needs to continue to develop. Then when we get to the safeties, Carl Joseph, Carl Joseph had a nice year coming out of West Virginia as a rookie last year. So that was a nice situation they found him in. And Reggie Nelson has found ways to stay productive. And that's what's awesome about Reggie Nelson. He's been around the league for a while, and he's been pretty productive everywhere he's been. Now he is on a contract year. So this kind of was what interesting to me. When the Raiders were sitting there in the second round, they went out and drafted Obi Melifonwu. By the way, I'm really proud of it. I know I've been crushing on that name. I practice it. So <laughs> Obi Melifonwu. Drafted him in the second round, who's just an absolute freak. So the question is, where does Obi fit? Obi played, he's a four-year starter at UConn. He played a while as a corner, then eventually moved to safety, and that's really where it clicked, and he really came on. So Obi, could he move to corner? Maybe in some situations, but he's 6'4", and he has a little bit of trouble in his pedal in staying vertical and not losing, losing the rock versus being the single high safety. So I think his future still is at safety which unfortunately, unfortunately tells me Reggie Nelson's probably not going to be back in the Raiders uniform next season. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's why you draft the safety in the second round, future starter. So yeah. that, what, what's it they say? Uh, if you draft a guy second, third round, he should be a starter for you within two to three years. Something like that, right? Yep, that's, that's the saying, 100% right. Reggie Nelson's going to be one of those guys where he's going to be on – he'll probably be a free agent next year. Some team will sign him. You know, maybe it'll be a team who's on the rise. Um, throwing the Eagles is a great example there. You know, what they did with Malcolm Jenkins or other situations you'll probably see with Reggie Nelson, and he'll be productive there too. But the Raiders simply have that mindset of, look, it's cheaper for us to probably move on from Reggie Nelson next season, draft Obi Mellon Fawn now, and then reallocate those money into some of our younger guys' contracts. Yeah, and, and they just gave Derek Carr a big contract too, so you got to be a little smarter now of how you spend your money. And I mean, Reggie Nelson, I don't know how old he is now, but obviously he's on the back end of his career. He's not getting any younger. So I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, okay. So Conley, you think he's ready to start right now? Like let's say Emerson kind of struggles. You put Conley out there. You think he'll be okay? Honestly, I probably would start Conley over Sean Smith right now. Okay. Um, I think that's the bigger battle than David Emerson, but I, I don't think David Amerson, his job is truly safe as the number one corner either. Yeah, I think Gary Conley is ready to roll it and start right now. But just like anything you do, you know, you always got to kind of sprinkle him in. So you'll probably see Conley come in and he'll probably get a lot of zone coverage calls when he's in, maybe not a lot of single man situations. 
yeah. and try to avoid situations where he's one on one with Demarius Thomas or you know some guys like, like Keenan Allen, guys in his division, kind of sprinkle them in slowly. All right, real quick, special teams. That uh, I'm trying to think, has there ever been? Actually, there's got to be been black punters before, right? But Marquette King's probably got the most swag out of all of them. Oh yeah, he's the swag king for sure. I mean, I like Marquette King a lot. My my buddy, who's a Raiders fan, he told me a story that when King was in college, he actually went as a receiver. Mm-hmm. He was a receiver in college, and then eventually was said, "Hey, if you want to kind of still get on scholarship and keep your money, go learn to punt." Well, now he's he was an All Pro punter last year, so I think he worked out pretty well. So. King, I'm a big fan of him. I, I love I love guys who can just show they're having fun with the game. And honestly, we we take the kickers and punters and kind of throw them in the back seat. So Marquette King, not only does he have a lot of cool antics, he's a dude. He's a really, really good player. And if you're a defense who's not playing high, your punter value is much, much higher. So Marquette King makes that Raiders defense a lot better. Mm, that's a good point. You know, uh, yeah, he and Pat McAfee. See, McAfee's out of the NFL now, so King's got the swag leadership now. Yep, there for sure. Yeah, Pat McAfee. We forgot to get him in our cult show, so we'll, we'll get him in now. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> Pat Mac. You were the man. My bad. All right. Uh, this is where we get to underrated, overrated, and uh, uh, well, hot seat. Who's on the hot seat? It's got to be Reggie Nelson. Uh, unfortunately, just because, again, with the situation you have there, the draft that, we talked about this in our chief show, mostly because of the draft. You know, Alex Smith was on the hot seat because of what they did in the draft. Reggie Nelson's on the hot seat because of what they did in the draft. So uh, I don't see it likely that Reggie Nelson sticks around unless, for some reason, obi Fanwu turns out to be a complete bust, which I don't think he will be by any means. But Reggie Nelson's my hot seat contender here in Oakland. Mario Edwards. Somebody's got to produce opposite of Khalil Mack. That's another awesome one, Adrian. Yeah, you invested a second-round pick in him. And it's a third year in the NFL. I mean, you got no reasons now. Honestly, in the NFL, sad to say, they don't care if you're hurt. They really don't. It's your third year in the NFL, and you're playing on a 4-3 defense with the best defensive end in in the NFL. If you're not able to be productive – you're gone, simply put. So, yeah, I would agree with you. He's the other one in the hot seat. Yeah. Uh, underrated Gabe Jackson just comes to mind immediately because everyone talks about Assemble, but but Jackson's really freaking good too. Yeah, I mean, Gabe Jackson, maybe he's not a top five guard in the NFL, but he's right there. Yeah. I mean, he's probably right after guys like, you know, Zach Martin's probably a, the third best guard in the NFL. So he's probably right in that mix as, you know, four through seven. I think, but yeah, I think that's a very fair one, Adrian, for underrated guy. I've got Yonda at one. I've got, I've actually got Martin at two and Assembly at three, but they both have the same number. Um, where the hell is Gabe Jackson? Gabe Jackson is at number nine. So he's up there. Okay. Uh, all right. What else? That's it, right? You got an underrated player? Uh, I don't have an underrated player here. I think everyone for the for the Raiders is is pretty much getting the love they deserve. Yeah. But I will talk fantasy here. Go ahead. And I want to kind of talk about Amari Cooper, and I want to talk about the overvalue of Amari Cooper. Now, he's that good. Is he a top ten receiver in the NFL? Yes, he is. But the overvalue of him is going to be in fantasy perspective. Amari Cooper is probably going to go in your in your league, probably at the late first, early second round. Okay. So and being a top 10 guy, that's probably fair. I mean, I, I think that's that's fair. Adrian, would you agree? Probably early second round, we're going to see Cooper getting drafted. Yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of how it would play. Like, definitely definitely third round, like, latest. Yeah, see, I, I think Cooper's going to go very, very high, especially in PPR formats. Yeah. But Crabtree's probably going to go one to two rounds later than Cooper. You're more, you're more the fantasy guy than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fantasy guy. Fair enough. So you're, what you're going to see here, guys, is you're going to see Cooper get drafted higher. Crabtree's probably going to get drafted one to two rounds later. But when you look at the numbers, Crabtree's going to have equal targets and pretty close receptions. Historically speaking, Crabtree's had more touchdowns, maybe not as many yards. So as far as the value there, Crabtree's value is extremely high. But Cooper is going to get drafted much higher. So I'm circling if you're not someone who's going to get – you know, Cooper, that's okay. 
wait a couple rounds, and then go ahead and grab Crabtree. He's going to produce very, very similar numbers for you. No, actually, I lied. I do know my fantasy football. I am the champion. Yeah, that did happen. I am the champion. I am the champion! That did happen. I got my name engraved right over there, Adrian Fetchew. There he is. Yeah. My name's engraved, not yours, motherfucker. No, it's not. (laughs) That's fair. That was funny. Oh, man. But I, I would I would agree with you on Cooper because I mean I, I those five touchdowns they only got five of them so yeah. got to get more touchdowns like that's that was my knock on Julio Julio Jones for the longest time was I always put Brown ahead of him like the last couple years but now Jones I do have ahead of Brown I don't think he's ever really had a double digit touchdown receptions he might have had it once and that was it. Yeah, I mean, but he's he's getting, you know, 100-plus receptions every single season. Well, that's too. why he's number one now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, my thought process is, is Cooper a top 10 receiver? Yeah, absolutely. And if he's your yeah. number one receiver in your fantasy league, you're going to do just fine. I'm not arguing that. But I'm just saying the value of Crabtree is going to get overlooked in your league. Crabtree would be a very, very good wide receiver number two for your fantasy, which you might be able to get in round two or three. Trying to, I, I think. Okay, here we go. Crabtree, eighty-nine receptions, one thousand three yards, eight touchdowns. Cooper, eighty-three receptions, one thousand one hundred fifty-three yards, five touchdowns. So Crabtree might actually have more fantasy points last year because of the yeah, touchdowns. probably did. Yeah, I mean that, that that's exactly what I'm saying. You're getting Crabtree two rounds later, and his numbers are going to be very similar to Cooper's. Yeah. All right, that's about it. We got nothing left, right? That's it. Looking forward to having the Las Vegas Raiders here in Vegas soon. Mm. Maybe I'll have some sea bass for dinner. There you go. Beast mode. Oh, sea bass and Skittles. Sea bass and Skittles. There it is. There it is. Fred and Albert, I'm Adrian Fed Q. I am the champion. Take care, guys. Hold it. High and proud, baby. <laughs>